Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord, and the offering of sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. Looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to him for what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, <clears throat> which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that time she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, good morning. I'm good morning. Pastor Jay, one of the pastors here at Pender. <clears throat> and it's good to be with you today. I, I want to uh, draw your attention to a couple things in the bulletin that we don't often highlight. One is, uh, do you ever read that little box about the missionaries? You need to do that. Um, Scott and Andy Mitchell, Campus Crusade workers, <clears throat> um, they have uh, um, a job that is hard every day, and they need our prayers, they need to be uplifted. So let's remember them. Um, let's remember not only um, Margie, who is ill, but uh, remember Dan, as he's been recovering from pneumonia, others that we know in the community that are um, that are ill this day. Um, we want to be praying for uh, Stan and for Dottie uh, Krizega. Uh, Dottie is very close to death, but very, um, uh, very calm and very peaceful. Stan is very resolved to what's going on. And they're surrounded by loved ones, and that's all good. We want to pray for Barbara Collegian, who uh, has been the entire holiday season has been in the hospital. Um, <coughs> really a, a hard time for her. We want to be praying for her. Are there others we need to be praying for that we want to just name today? And yes, Pat? Donna Faith and Daisy Sullivan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Shirley Fisher. Shirley Fisher. Okay. Yes. Please, everybody, pray for... Um, we had a flood in our building yesterday where I live, and 20 of the apartments were flooded. I was lucky. Mine was not. I'm on mm. the other end. Mm. But please pray for everybody that... Okay. People who have been displaced. They've had to have been yeah. displaced, and they're going to lose a lot of stuff. <clears throat> okay. So. All right, thank you. Others? Yes, Mark? Uh, my brother-in-law, Doug, and all who are fighting cancer. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, let's pray for a moment, shall we? Well, God, we, we call you gracious this day. As our time shifts, we praise you for being timeless. As we are aware of our limitations, we praise you for being boundless. As we count time on our watches, we are aware that you are, that you are infinite and beyond time. So we pray for those who are cold today. We pray for the workers in shelters across our area. We pray for those who need to be touched by your healing grace. We name before you Dottie and Barbara and others that your voice. 
We pray for so many, Lord, who look at a new year and see it not as a year of health. We pray that you would encourage them. We pray for Scott and for Andy Mitchell as they serve you as Campus Crusade directors. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would touch those who are comfortable aching or destroying or being angry. Touch them and soften them, Lord. Heal them. We pray for people in fear. We pray for people who live in darkness. We pray for ourselves and for each other. And that this church and that your church universal might make a huge difference in a new year. And we pray as Jesus, as Jesus would accompany our prayer. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you kind of review in your own head um, all the stories in Scripture that are part of the Christmas saga. There's a, there's a lot of waiting that's going on in Scripture. Do you notice that? You've got Mary and Elizabeth waiting for their pregnancy to be completed. You've got um, Zechariah, um, Elizabeth's husband, waiting for his voice to return. We've got the kings waiting for the star to stop, so that means that they finally arrived at their destination. Um, so just lots of waiting going on. And now as Jesus' parents take him to the temple, they come upon Simeon and Anna. They have been waiting. They've been waiting for years. They've been waiting their entire lives, waiting for Mary and Joseph to arrive. Simeon, the scripture said, was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, consolation is kind of a, a weird word. Um, it only occurs a couple of times. I'll stay away from that mic. Uh, it only occurs a couple of times in Scripture. Um, and we don't have a, a really warm, fuzzy feeling about consolation. You know that? Um, consolation means to bring comfort or to bring relief or to bring help. Um, but it's just not a high value for us. Um, as, as Harry knows, I love to talk about my kids. Uh, our son, David, um, was in a foot race one time. Uh, first grade, we heard about it for days. A foot race is coming, and he'd go out in the backyard and practice. Um, <laughs> I'm supposed to stay still. Um, and, and he was just determined that he was gonna win that first grade foot race. Well, as you can imagine, he didn't win. And one of his best friends beat him. And she was a girl. <laughs> and there was just no consoling him. He was devastated. There was no consolation. We, we really, you know, in our culture, we don't expect to receive consolation because we expect to win. We expect to come in first. You know, we know about that other part of the tournament where the, the teams that have come in fourth and fifth and sixth place, they play a consolation game. We know that. We don't want any part of that. No, we want to be the winner. We would be the one that is not consoled, but maybe offers consolation to the other teams. We do not want to be relegated to receive consolation because we've tried hard. That's just not where we are. So why was Simeon waiting for consolation? Doesn't sound like a very great thing to wait for. Well, if you think about it, he was waiting for consolation because consolation would be better than what Israel had been experiencing for so long. They'd really reached the end of their endurance. They'd been beaten up, they'd been trampled, they'd been defeated, they'd been humiliated, they'd been compromised for hundreds of years. I can imagine Israel praying to God every night, hey God, how about a little consolation prize? That would be better than what we got. 
And can you just help us feel a little bit better about the mess we're in? About the, best, about the mess that we've been in. God, when is it ever going to stop this living under the heel of Rome? When will the glory days of King David return? I suppose for Simeon and Anna, that day that Mary and Joseph came to the temple was kind of an ordinary day an ordinary day of waiting for the consolation of Israel. But when they saw the baby, when they saw Jesus, God rewarded the depth of faith that they had had all those years by giving them the eyes, the eyes to see what others did not see. And what they saw that day that was that it was no ordinary day, after all. And this was no ordinary baby. Anna begins to praise God, the scripture says. And to describe this child and, and connect the dots. Anna sees that this child is, is connected to the longing that Israel has had for redemption. Redemption at the hands of their almighty God. And Simeon offers this beautiful, beautiful prayer. He says, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, capital W, your word. For my eyes now have seen your salvation. You have prepared a salvation in the presence of all people, a light of revelation for the Gentiles. The glory of your people Israel. A beautiful, a beautiful prayer that Simeon prays. For Simeon and Anna, an extraordinary day of endings and beginnings. You see that the ending of their lives was near. They were coming down the hill. They were old and they knew the end was coming. And yet, God had graciously allowed them to live long enough to see the Messiah. It was a kind of a fading out. Um, Simeon uses the word dismissed. He was being dismissed from life. He was departing in peace. He was leaving words of prophecy for a manger born baby. It was all ending the way it should. But zooming into that ending was a beginning. A beginning that not even they could see, but they acknowledged that it was happening. It was a beginning. It was a, a birth, not only of a child, but also a, a new movement from God that was going to take off from there. Salvation for all. Revelation for non-Jews. Glory for Israel. You see, Simeon had been content to wait for <laughs> consolation. But God blew past the whole idea of consolation to announce redemption. <clears throat> to announce that everything would be changing. Everything would be beginning anew. Amazing. Beginnings and endings. We understand endings and beginnings with the letters of the Greek alphabet. We talk about alpha and omega, the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But let's consider these other letters too, the BC in the AD. The Gregorian calendar, you all know about that. That's a good Jeopardy question. You can answer that, right? Okay. <laughs> Most widely used calendar in the world today. It is the global standard and has been for many, many centuries. It has this huge beginning and ending kind of separation. BC meaning before Christ. AD meaning, say it in Latin, Anno Domini. Okay, the year of our Lord. Now, we know that A.D. is kind of falling out of usage in our secular world, and people want to 
re replace that with the letters CE for the Common Era. But we know what AD means. We know about Anno Domini. But you see that the, the birth narratives of both Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, the, the prophecies of Simeon and Anna, they are pointing to the moment that AD begins the beginning of a new time. And it's such a momentous beginning because B.C. is forever in the past. And A.D. is forever revealed in the present and in the future. Everything is changing. Everything is beginning anew. I've been reading some things that, by Joseph Campbell. He's an anthropologist who has specialized in the study of different religions around the world. And what he's especially attuned to is, is holy moments. Holy moments. Think about the holy moments in your life. And he's found parallels among all the religions of the world, past and present that there's some significant parallels of things that seem to happen in every religious system. And he believes that's because God is at work. God is at work creating holy moments for us. And part of what um, Campbell says is that the beginning of spirituality is to grasp the meaning of our beginnings and the meaning of our endings and how they are related each to the other and how they flow from one end to the other. And I think that's so significant. If you think about scripture, just think how much of our scripture is devoted to tell the story of beginnings and how much of our scripture is devoted to telling the story of endings and how the two are related each to the other. Now, what I believe, what I believe is that the beginning, that in beginning times and ending times, there's a, there's a thinning of the veil that separates human experience from God reality. Now, think about that in terms of your own life. At beginning and ending times, there's a thinning of that veil. Think about birth for a moment. Birth is truly an amazing beginning, an amazing experience, and it's, is it not a holy moment when life begins? How many would say that they've been there for birth and they've seen it as a holy moment when life begins? And at the, other, at the other side, death is an amazing experience, also totally out of our control, out of our timing. It can be beautiful. It definitely is transition that is beyond words. Is not death also a holy moment? Beginnings and endings in times when God is so close, so close, times when we are available to be touched by God, and it feels like God is available to be touched by us, that veil is so thin. Have we not seen that ourselves? So what could be the holy moment of turning our calendar from 2017 to 2018. Could that be a holy moment for us? It's truly an ending and a beginning. How are you feeling about what's ending today? About letting go of this whole year that we have numbered 2017? Has it been a year of more downs than ups? Has it been a year that was more mediocre than exceptional? 
or to paraphrase T.S. Eliot, has it been a year that was more of a whimper than a bang? Did you find yourself saying about this year, well, yeah, there just weren't any big wins. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Or do you find yourself saying, well, I didn't really have any huge thumbs up moments, but I was able to push forward, and maybe the thumbs up moment will come sometime later. Or perhaps if you're like me, you, you find 2017 to have been a year when you have had to shoulder some amazing disappointments, and you're really to let it go. Disappointments in leaders disappointments in institutions, disappointments maybe in, in friends or in family or disappointments in ourselves. Yeah, let's let that year go in all of its disappointments. Is there any integrity, we wonder, any integrity left as we move into a new year? How about it, God? How about it? <laughs> could you create a holy moment for us now? Maybe we could get a little consolation. That would be nice if we got a little consolation as we move from 2017 to 2018, as we flip that calendar. Can I at least get a little comfort, God? Could I get a little relief? Could I, I get a little help? I'm waiting for your consolation, Lord. Some reassurance that you're still in this mess with me. Or, you know, maybe you're feeling pretty good about life. Maybe you've got a lot of blessings to count. And yet you find yourself when someone mentions the word future, uh, that you kind of shake your head or you look down or change the subject. I'm not really sure about future. That sounds pretty unstable. We find that we're not sure what's coming. And, and if we're not careful, we, we catch ourselves actually gripping as tight as we can, hoping that 2018 will be a good year. We just hold on tight enough. I wonder, is it possible that Simeon underestimated the power and the plan of God when he only asked for consolation. But to be sure, in Jesus, what the world received in Jesus was very consoling. That, oh, so far beyond consoling. For what the world has received in Jesus is wholeness. It is completeness. It is power. Power in God's spirit. It is salvation for us. It is so far beyond consoling. It is life itself. It is meaning for all of our days and all of our relationships and all of the events of our life to have meaning for us. It is redemption. It is reclaiming the value of who we are as we move from one year to the next, from one belief to the next. When we believe in Jesus, we receive so much more than consolation. And part of what we receive is a Savior who sacrificed himself for us. Such a high price. He paid for our wholeness. For Jesus lived ever true to God's mission, God's sending of him for a specific purpose, for a victory that came in an empty grave. You know, I think it's possible that Simeon underestimated that all God had in store for Israel was consolation. But maybe we possibly have underestimated what God has in store for us. Is it possible that our faith could be so well grounded that our eyes will see what Simeon and Anna saw? That our eyes will see Jesus and know that he is the one 
that our eyes will see that in the ending of the year, in the beginning of the year, that God is announcing to us that God will be with us. Is it possible that we will see that the veil is thin and that our world and God's world are so close, so close. Is it possible that we will see, moving into this new year, that God has something for each one of us in this new year and for all of us? Something beyond consolation. Something like what we see in the person, in the teachings, in the parables, in the life, in the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And thanks be to God that we are given those eyes to see if we would but open our eyes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.